Um, the rest of this chapter, until we get to um, the uh, band theory section, um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because you can read this in the textbook and it's, it's more something that you need to just have heard about than I'm going to ask you detailed questions about. Um, carbon is interesting because it forms several different forms. Um, they're called allotropes. Um, there's graphite, which is what's in your pencil. In graphite, we have these hexagonal rings of covalently bonded carbon atoms, but they are in sheets. And so between the sheets are just uh, intermolecular forces, dispersion forces, that hold the sheets together. And so these different layers will slide easily. And that's what makes graphite slippery. So we can use graphite as a lubricant um, because it will slide on itself. It, it works well as a pencil lead because as you move it across the paper, it will leave bits behind. Um, it's a good conductor because there's an extended pi bonding network above and below this layer that allows um, electrons to move. Most nonmetals don't conduct electricity, but graphite does. Graphite has a density of about 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter. If you put that graphite under high pressure, you can get the structure to rearrange and form a diamond. In a diamond, now we have the carbon atoms bonded in three dimensions, not just in two dimensions. Uh, so normally diamonds form underground over a long period of time, but they can also be made synthetically using pressures of like 50,000 atmospheres and temperatures of like 1600 degrees Celsius. Um, so you, as you can imagine that's kind of expensive to do it that way, but digging them up is kind of expensive too. And they're pretty, and so that's why people like them. Yeah, I think I think a a man-made diamond and a natural diamond. I I'm sure there must be some small differences in them, but um, if they were both perfect, they would be identical. It probably has the difference between them. Probably has to do with what sorts of imperfections are present. So the unit cell for those carbon atoms is similar to that zinc blend structure where we had um, a face-centered cubic and then the zinc ions were occupying half of the tetrahedral holes. Yeah? I had a question in regards to the, uh, to the diamond. When, mm -hmm. when they put it under that pressure and that heat, when they release the pressure and the heat, does it stay together because of the new ways they're connected? Yes. So when they, when they, if you take graphite and put it under extreme pressure and heat, what you're causing is you're causing the bonds, the covalent bonds, to break and reform. And because of the increased pressure, it's going to reform into a more dense solid. Uh, diamonds have a higher density than graphite. There's less empty space. So the carbon atoms um, are occupying that face-centered cell and the tetrahedral holes. Um, diamonds, are diamonds are not conductive, no. They do not conduct electricity because they don't have an ex extended pi bonding network. Because now each of these carbon atoms is covalently bonded in a tetrahedral way to four other carbon atoms. And so that would be sp3 hybridization. There aren't any pi orbitals or pi bonds at all. Diamond has a really high melting point. It's really hard. Um, it conducts heat well. And so it's really good for abrasives and cutting tools because you want something that's really hard, but that will also conduct the heat away from what you're cutting because the friction of cutting can make things extremely hot. There are several new kinds of carbon, new forms. Um, Buckminster fullerene was discovered in the 1980s um, by aiming a powerful laser at a carbon surface. Um, these are named um, 
well, I think that's on the next page. They're, they're sort of soccer ball shaped clusters. Um, the Buckminster Fullerene is um, 60 carbons. Um, fullerenes in general, they're sometimes called bucky balls. Um, they can range from 36 carbon atoms to more than 100 carbon atoms. And so these um, ha are an individual molecule of a large number of carbon atoms. Um, we mentioned graphene back in the very beginning of this chapter. Um, so, you know, Buckminster fullerene was synthesized, and so then people have been looking into other ways of making carbon structures. Um, you can get these uh, long carbon structures called nanotubes, which are um, they're interconnected C6 rings that form cylinders. So they're a bit like a roll of chicken wire, right? Except instead of just you know being hooked together at the end, it is actually continuous all the way around. You can make ribbons. Um, you can take these nanotubes and nest them inside of each other. So you can have multi-walled nanotubes. Um, and then this is a graphene sheet, which is a single layer of these C6 rings. So these nanotubes are really strong. They're 100 times stronger than steel, and they're 1 16th as dense. And so they're really useful for things like bicycle frames and golf club shafts and things like that. You can also make tiny wires from bundles of nanotubes because they do conduct electricity. Um, another kind of network covalent atomic solid is our silicates. Um, these are a little different because there's two different kinds of atoms here. It's an extended array of silicon and oxygen, but they're not individual molecules that are held together by intermolecular forces. It's one array of covalently bonded atoms. So silica has a formula unit, SiO2. That just gives us the ratio of silicon atoms to oxygen atoms. It's not SiO2 molecules. A silicon atom is actually covalently bonded to four different oxygen atoms. Um, this is the most common network covalent solid. Um, sand, cement, glass, all of those contain silicates. Uh, quartz is one form of silica. Um, there are lots of different forms. Here we're showing this tetrahedral arrangement right here between the oxygens and the silicon.